Okay, welcome to our lecture on fundamental structures and introduction to structural analysis. In today's lecture, I want to show a few geologic structures to motivate our discussion, and we're going to draw a bunch of those from the Grand Canyon and also point out how important geologic time is for structural geology. The big distinction we'll make is the difference between primary and secondary structures, and in our class, we're really studying secondary structures. And then we'll move into some introductory concepts, basically the ideas of deformation, and then the three kinds of analysis that progress through structural geology, descriptive, kinematic, and dynamic or mechanical analysis. So here's a view of the Grand Canyon taken from the south rim. So we're looking north. And here, what do we see? We see layers, uh, the slopes, uh, cliffs, we see the inner inner gorge here, so the Grand Canyon's down, or the Colorado River's down at the bottom. There you see a little water. We also see Bright Angel Creek, this long valley here. It's straight, and the reason why it's straight is because it's uh, eroded along a fault that provides its own weakness uh, called the Bright Angel Fault, and that's Bright Angel Creek. So here we start to be able to differentiate structures that um, form when the rock forms, like the sedimentary layering here, uh, versus those that form afterwards, and, and the, such as faults that might cut the layers. So here's a, a primary structure. These are some sand uh, deposits in the Grand Canyon along the river, and you see this uh, layering here, and then also uh, the second set of lines. These are, are ripples that... Um, well, the ripples are on the surface, and then the structure that's developed as the sediment accumulates is uh, this prime climbing cross lamination. And so this is a primary structure. It's a structure that forms when the rock forms. Here's a view from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We see some people on the boat, and uh, there's erosion into these metamorphic rocks. We see an important boundary uh, between the uh, basement rocks, the oldest rocks, and these sedimentary layers. That's an unconformity. Um, and then on the side of the valley, we see the young deposits that uh, define the most recent sedimentation in, along the river. In this view from the bottom of the Grand Canyon, we see a really important understanding of geologic history that's preserved in this outcrop. Down at the bottom, we see some layers that are nearly vertical. And uh, those are then overlain unconformably at this level by these uh, nearly horizontal sandstones. And so this angular unconformity gives us a picture of the, the topography at the time when the uh, upper layers were deposited um, and also uh, shows that their deformation, you see these layers are kind of warped over this little uh, island that was developed there. And so not all deformation comes from tectonic stresses and uh, you know, deformation that's is kind of from the far field. Sometimes we can have uh, deformation that just comes from compaction. Here's a view here in the Grand Canyon where we see again this unconformity uh, between the steeply dipping metamorphose layers and the nearly horizontal uh, sandstones. Here is that view again. You see the kind of really nice picture of what was going on where there's erosion of these lower layers and that's deposited as this conglomerate which gets worked and reworked as time passes. Uh, sometimes the subject can be a little bit uh, tiring, but other times it can be really inspiring where you have to kiss the great unconformity. And so when we look at the Grand Canyon, we see then this amazing history of uh, geology and of the earth uh, here in, we have in northern Arizona. And what those people were just looking at uh, was right here, basically this angular unconformity between these billion-year-old rocks of the Grand Canyon supergroup and the 500-million-year-old um, Paleozoic sequence that starts with the Tapit sandstone and goes into the Bright Angel. And so a lot of what we do in structural geology is use the 
relationships we can see in the field and, and in, let's say, the geochemistry and geophysical uh, characterization, characterization of, of the geology to, to build a, up a history of, of events. And so in this case, we can see the, the sort of old history of, of formation of primary structures and subsequent tilting and deformation and injection of molten material, sedimentation and then faulting and tilting, lots of erosion to build that great unconformity. Uh, then uh, important history of sedimentation and a relatively stable condition through the Paleozoic. Um, and, and that also is associated with the uh, important evolutionary history of life on the Earth. So it's, it's uh, you know, structural geology is so really fundamental to our toolkit for uh, understanding what has happened on the Earth. And geologic time is a critical uh, thing that geologists bring to the table. We know about the great history of the Earth, and uh, it's manifest by many pieces of evidence, both relative age as well as the numerical age that comes from geochemical uh, measures of, of radioactive decay. And so it's really critical to keep in mind uh, geologic time and, and to set in your mind what are these uh, time periods, the names of them, and when they occurred. And so, for example, what I just talked about, the Grand Canyon history is starting in uh, maybe a, a, the oldest rocks are just uh, younger than 2 billion, and the top of that Grand Canyon sequence goes up to the Permian. Now, there's a lot of geologic history that's missing through the Mesozoic, and then we know that uh, the Grand Canyon started cutting down uh, at least several million years ago, and, and so we see the, the modern landscape that we have. So we'll come back to see that uh, important piece of missing time that's right in here at the uh, Paleozoic Precambrian boundary. Those sandstones are Cambrian in age, and the underlying units are about a billion years old. So let's have a look at this. This is an important place in the Grand Canyon near Hans Rapid. And what I'd like for you to do is to take a moment just to sketch out what you see here. And the key thing is not to worry about the geomorphology or, or the landscape, but more see through the, you know, debris on the hill slope and don't worry about what the people on the boat are doing, but what's this big black uh, rock unit or body and how does that compare to the red ones and then what about this white thing here which one is younger and which one's older and, and so what what you should be able to come up with is the idea that um, you know cross-cutting relationships so we know if something cuts something else that which is doing the cutting is younger so this black rock body is younger than the red units and the red units are relatively horizontal and kind of finely layered and they seem to be cut by this this inclined body of rock that's dark but has some wavy layers in it or surfaces but then also this important uh, set of uh, lines that are perpendicular to its edges and uh, so then what we wonder is, well, what are the motions of the, the rocks? How did this all happen? And so what we might look at as well, it looks like, you know, this layer here is, you know, the same as that layer there. So if you draw a line that connects those, you can see, oh, it looks like the this black material um, basically just moved the... Uh, red rocks apart perpendicular to the walls of this uh, body of rock that's black and that's important to recognize so the motion was basically perpendicular to its walls as opposed to parallel and we'll talk a lot about that distinction in our class when we talk about relative motion across fractures and so our interpretation of this is that this is an a, the black rock is is a basalt that was intruded uh, as a molten rock was injected into these red 
uh, shales and they push the rocks apart. Um, and uh, basically due to the pressure of the molten rock. And so sometimes we call this a dike or uh, uh, usually dikes are more vertical, but this uh, still is uh, cutting across the layering. And it's a kind of a blade shaped body of molten rock that probably fed volcanoes uh, at the surface. The other thing is it clearly wasn't isolated. There's some finer uh, features that cut sort of sub parallel to the black one, but these are light in color and they probably are associated with the same intrusion event. Um, but in they maybe didn't really convey any of the basalt, but rather conveyed some of the hot fluids that were. Um, kind of coming in at the same time as the basalt was, or maybe that were heated by the basalt and its intrusion. So let's just keep moving, talking about different kinds of structures. The, in this case, the, these layers were once horizontal sedimentary layers, but they've been deformed and folded uh, here uh, due to deformation in uh, Canada, Western Canada. Here's one I showed it on our uh, web page for our class, but this is a metamorphic rock, and you see that there's some important sort of planar or, or uh, layering, um, and then there's these this fine feature that has this kind of tail here and another tail there that seems to imply that it was uh, rotated, and so these materials were quite fluid. Uh, set some time in their history and the rotation of this little um, mineral grain uh, was quite independent of the motion of the surrounding material although you might imagine that perhaps the upper side was kind of sheared to the right and it it helped to sort of drive the flow that spun that crystal here's a view uh, again from the grand canyon we see a fault, which is a vertical, uh, in this case, a surface, a planar surface that's vertical in this case, not all faults are vertical, but it shows with the grooving on the fault surface behind the boatman there, uh, a sense of motion that looks like the far side moved parallel to the fault surface and to the left. So this would be a left lateral fault. Uh, and Unlike the dike that we saw earlier, here the motions are parallel to the surface, not perpendicular to that uh, fracture surface. Here's a case where, at first, you may look at this and you know wonder what's going on. Here's a hammer for scale, and these are gneisses, or pretty uh, serious metamorphosed rocks. And what has happened is that they've been squeezed in such a way that they developed a orient, preferred orientation of the minerals that's quite linear. And so we have this, what we call a lineation, or kind of a preferential orientation of the minerals, that then when the rock breaks, it sort of follows along those zones of weakness. And this uh, linear uh, arrangement is kind of through the rock at all scales, and so we, we sometimes say that it's penetrative or it penetrates the rock. So let's summarize for a moment and say that the fundamental structures we talk about are the most important ones are contacts, depositional contacts, but also unconformities, intrusive contacts, faulted contacts, and shear zones. So boundary between boundaries between rocks are are fundamental geologic structures. So primary structures are those that develop during the formation of a rock body. So you can think of for example, in magma or lava, before it becomes an intrusive volcanic rock, the vesicles and flow banding are the primary structures. In sediments, before they become sedimentary rocks, things like cross beds or ripple marks, like what I showed, are the primary structures. In many metamorphic rocks, what we tend to see is that the structures that form are developing due to the deformation of the what was once a igneous or sedimentary rocks, so most of their structures are secondary. And so the secondary structures, which are the focus of our course, and don't be sad that uh, structural geology is about secondary structures, because 
that's still very important. Uh, they form in sedimentary or igneous rocks act after lithification or in metamorphic rocks during or after their formation. So examples include joints and shear fractures, faults, folds, cleavage, foliation, lineation, which remember I talked about are th these orientations of minerals that go through the rock and usually develop due to flow of the rock, but not necessarily because it melted, just that it was... Uh, hot and um, at high pressure and the part of the crystals were able to move in almost a solid sense and then shear zones are uh, similar to faults but just a little bit more broader zone of, of deformation so uh, something I've said already a few times but a key term is deformation and so that's the fundamental thing we do in structural geology is think about the change in shape from some initial or undeformed to some subsequent deformed configuration. And qualitatively, there's two terms that we use a lot, and I think these are worth memorizing. The first one is brittle. So brittle deformation is that which is discrete failure accommodating the deformation and the formation of faults and fractures. So all the deformations on these boundaries and what's between the boundaries or between the fractures is uh, relatively undeformed. Uh, and then in contrast, ductile deformation is distributed, so mostly uh, it's due to flow. And we'll see that we can uh, have both of these in a rock, and a lot of times it depends on the scale. Also, we'll see that what kind of controls the brittleness or ductileness of the rock is some of the conditions. How hot is it? how much pressure it is, what kind of material is it. So now moving into uh, kind of a little bit of an outline of what we do in structural geology, especially as defined by the uh, Davis, Reynolds, and Kluth uh, textbook, is they, ta they kind of divide up our activities into three analyses. So first thing is descriptive analysis. And there we recognize and describe structures and measure their locations, geometries, and orientations. And we care about the scale and the elements. So that's just you know what's there and how is it arranged. Then we do kinematic analysis. And this is really focusing on the motion of materials. So kinematics is the study of motion. And then dynamic analysis is one where we interpret the motions in terms of applied forces. So we use basic physics. And so a lot of times it's critical that we recognize that the observations have to match the scale of the problem. So on the left, you can see a picture, and we see some uh, layers. You, if you follow this one, you can see it comes around, then it goes down like that, and then it comes back up. So these layers are, are inclined. They're dipping off to the left. And they look pretty continuous at that scale, but when you zoom in and you see here's the same layers as a camera, you see that they're finely fractured. And, and the dominant thing we see is this breakage of the rock in a really distributed sense across the whole zone. So, you know, depending on what scale you look at, you see different things. And those different things are important uh, sort of as geometric components of, of the rocks. And so sometimes the term that gets used is architecture, and that's the arrangement of the different structural elements. And the analogy that the book uses that's quite nice is uh, this fence and the gate. So we see we have the fence, and it has uh, some hinges and um, a, a little lock on the, on the gate here. And so the slats are connected to these horizontal um, boards. But in the case of the, the initial design of the gate, you see that there's the weight of those uh, slats is much larger than just the frictional contact area between the slats and the, the boards that are behind. And so we get this deformation, this change in shape of the gate, and it sags. So then we can fix it by putting in an additional board and nailing it that basically adds additional strength and it keeps the the boards from sliding they they don't want to slide and and 
this then makes our gate quite a bit stronger. So the point is that these different elements, which are especially the slats and then the boards behind and then this crossboard, when all connected together through the nailing, um, provide a, a kind of an arrangement of objects that has some function. In this case, it's a gate. But the same idea can be applied to structural geology uh, in terms of understanding how the different elements of a certain zone uh, can work together. So here we see uh, some bedded rocks with then a bunch of fractures, and many of those fractures might be uh, kind of like the slats here where they're ready to, if we apply any force, they may be quite weak and they can uh, al allow for some motion. So now as we look at uh, this rock and we can, the, what we see is the rock layers come around and they turn and then here's a, a boundary between them and then these rocks turn again. So this is a fold and we'll spend a fair amount of time in our class talking about folding. Um, but we can idealize, we can put names to the different parts. And so this is the key activity in structural, ge uh, structural geology that's called idealization. So we don't worry about all the details of, you know, how this rock looks and how it's weathered and everything, but more just, okay, so there's a bedding surface here. And as a primary structure, it was the contact between two different uh, depositional events or sedimentary rocks, um, but that was deformed or changed its shape, and so now it, it has a new shape like this, this folded bedding surface. Here's another one, and so if we connect the, the zones of highest curvature, the tightest parts of the fold, so this hinge point with one up here, we can identify what is called the axial surface, and so that's the surface that kind of connects each of those hinge points. And so in a way, then we can take the rocks away and we just have these idealized features that identify the fold. So here's a bigger scale. This is a view of uh, the Rocky Mountains in, in Canada. So east is on the right and, and west would be on the left. And the different dot patterns are different sedimentary units um, originally on the edge of the continent. And they were deformed, so rocks were sort of pushed, uh, especially from left to right, and uh, in order to accommodate that deformation, there was lots of motion of, you know, for example, this sedimentary layer was displaced relative to its original uh, continuous uh, zone below along this fault surface, and, but at the same time, there's also uh, not all the rocks were faulted, some are folded, and so we have this combination of faults and folds called a fold and thrust belt. And what's important is to just get a sense of the language that we might use in a professional sense to describe this, uh, this pattern. And so this is from the textbook, and I'll just read it. The structure of this part of the Canadian Cordillera is dominated by thrust faults, which are generally southwest dipping and concave upward in profile. The, flats, the faults flatten with depth and have the upper side displaced relatively northeastward and upward. They gradually cut up through stratigraphic layering northeastward, but commonly follow the layering over large areas. Many of the faults bifurcate upwards into numerous splays, and the total displacement along them becomes distributed among these splays. Folds are widespread and have developed in conjunction with the thrusting. Many of the thrust faults themselves are folded along with the sedimentary layering. The folds generally are inclined to the northeast or are upright. Many of the thrusts die out as folds. So the point of this is just to say that, you know, as we learn structural geology, you begin to see that you have to take apart this complex set of features give each one of them a name, and then use this kind of very clear descriptive language to say uh, kind of how they're arranged, and then something about how they got to look the way they are. So uh, the next thing we can talk about is uh, kinematics, or how things move. And I showed this uh, already in our first lecture, but here's a view of um, 
Western North America, going from uh, both, mostly of Southern California. So uh, Arizona's just off on the right, and um, these green patches, this would be the Colorado River. And the um, blue line is the San Andreas Fault, so the main plate boundary of uh, Western North America as it touches the Pacific Plate. And the little arrows show the um, relative motion between that particular location and stable North America, which is in uh, Matt, kind of idealized as Massachusetts. So what you can see is that, and, and the largest motions are about 50 millimeters per year. So Arizona, for example, is still quite stable relative to eastern North America. But as we approach that plate boundary zone, we see that the motions increase rapidly, although not instantaneously. And so it's this motion here that basically looks like the particles are, are kind of flowing um, that is enabled by modern technology like global positioning system, but also is something we think has happened over geologic time to build the structures that we see. This is also important from a hazard standpoint because this is what drives the stressing along the faults that makes them uh, want to slip and cause earthquakes. So deformation that uh, we can see are, is kind of idealized by these this little balloon uh, cartoons from the textbook. And the key thing to distinguish, first of all, is rigid versus non-rigid body deformation. So rigid just means that it, it uh, the basically the given object, like in this case the balloon, its uh, shape stays the same, um, but as the whole thing moves as 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 a whole. So in the case of translation, this entire balloon moves up but it could also rotate. So those are rigid bodies. So the rock or the balloon stays the same shape, but it it moves. Um, on the other hand, non-rigid body deformation would be shown, for example, by this dilation. When you inflate the balloon, it gets bigger, right? And you could deflate it, and then it gets smaller. But uh, every part of the balloon's basically increasing about the same amount of size. It's kind of a uniform dilation. Um, what's most complicated then would be the distortion, where we have this non-uniform, non-rigid body deformation shown in uh, slide D there, where the two balloons ran into each other and the pilots are mad at each other. So coming back then to the scale and the key question we may say, well, you know, depends on how you look. So if you, you know, you start at a view like... Um, this this outcrop here, you see a pencil and uh, the ruler. You see many fine, small little fractures. But when you zoom out to uh, this area, you see kilometers, you see a road, and we see that, oh, these layers are actually folded. And what we saw on the smaller scale was just one part of the sedimentary rocks. Um, and so we see that, well, the folding shows kind of more continuous deformation, but perhaps it was accommodated by this, uh, by motion along these very uh, small little fractures, a little bit each one. So same thing if we go and we look at uh, this case here, another one where there's individual big faults shown here where these sedimentary layers are offset. Um, and But if you stand back, you see, oh, they're part of a, a major group that allows for quite a bit of motion to be accommodated from joy, you know, across to Mudville and beyond. So the point here is, uh, you know, just that these systematic movements along relatively closely spaced surfaces of slip can produce significant deformation of rock. So one way you can think of this as a card deck. So if you think of the card deck, you know, each one of the cards doesn't change its shape. It's fixed, solid card. But if you, you slide the cards past each other, they shear, and you can get quite a bit of motion. And so the interface between each of the cards is like a small fault. So coming then to, all right, well, what do we do with all of this? Let's, let's take an example of, uh, from the textbook of this pizza. And so first thing is to, before we do the explanation, which would be the dynamic models, is let's, 
do our descriptive and, and kinematic analysis. So the first thing is to see what's there. And so we see this pizza and has these are uh, pepperonis. And so at first you see, okay, they're pretty well arranged. They're sitting in the, the cheese. But then we see, oh, look at that. There's two missing pepperonis and they've been moved there down here. We don't know yet about what happened to them. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. And if we take a slice from A to A prime, we can see this little cross section. And we see, oh yeah, here's the hole where the uh, pepperoni was, and now it's sitting on top of the other pepperoni. And so we have a sense of the relative motion of them. So in, in a, a sense, the first thing to do in our descriptive analysis is to make this geologic map and the cross section. Second thing we would do is have the kinematic analysis to say, all right, well, it looks like this uh, pepperoni moved 5.1 inches on a uh, this direction, and it might have rotated about 15 degrees. Then the other one moved 3.7 inches, and it rotated a little bit about 5 degrees. So we we can describe the motion of the particles. Now we need to have a dynamic model. We need to have some kind of explanation, and so that's what what the dynamic model is. And here's the quote from textbook. My, meaning uh, George Davis, the lead author, working model is that the manufacturer, after preparing the pizzas, chose not to stack the box, boxed pizzas horizontally in freezer compartments. The manufacturer may have concluded, perhaps on the basis of experimentation, that tall stacking of pizza-filled boxes might have the adverse effect of flattening cardboard to cheese and tomato sauce before freezing set in. Instead, the pizzas may have been filed vertically. However, if moist, the pepperoni under the influence of gravitational forces might have been vulnerable to translation along the low viscosity tomato sauce cheese uh, discontinuity. Each of the pepperoni rounds would have would cease have ceased moving when it encountered the frictional resistance of another one. What was not clear to me then, nor is it now, is the rate at which the pepperoni moved. Was it rapid or sluggish? The magnitude of the stresses Required to initiate movement is also a puzzle. In fact, interpreting the strength of the various materials as a function of temperature would constitute a major study in itself. And so this is it maybe a little bit silly, but it's hopefully also a tangible example of putting a story together. Describe what's happened, or describe the geometry, say what happened in terms of motions, and then come up with a model to explain it. And we always have some uncertainties. No model is perfect. There's always different models to explain whatever you see, and usually we end our statement of a model with some set of questions. So dynamic models can also, uh, you know, come from sort of physical models or sandbox models where we ex we idealize how the Earth works in a simplified sense, like uh, sand, and we can pull or push on the edges of a sandbox and and build intuition and see what what's going on and uh, start to, in a controlled sense, um, explain what's happening. And so, for example, up here in the upper left is a, a zone that's been sheared to the right, but we see this kind of complex fracturing across the overall shear zone. In the middle uh, view here on the left is some extension but also sedimentation. So this is a kind of experiment that might have been used by a petroleum industry study. Uh, then lower left shows a, a zone of, of subsidence along a little step over of a fault zone. And then here's somebody contemplating there on the right this experiment, which is the one at the left. And down below there's even a, some kind of inflated pillow underneath our sand that's maybe something more like a volcanic magma chamber, and we can exper explore what kind of fracturing might occur above that. Okay, so he, as a final example of the dynamic analysis, let's step back to just look at what happened in the Mojave Desert in 1992. And this is a, a photograph from the air from a balloon that was lifting a camera that I triggered. And so you see the two people here, the shadows of them. And the shot, the sunlight is reflecting off this fault scarp, so it's a, a little cliff that was formed in the earthquake as the side was lifted. 
but also this stream channel here used to be continuous across the fault and it's been bent or been displaced and so this site had about five meters of horizontal motion and about one meter of vertical that uh, was the deformation right at the fault surface at in this one portion now we can use something like global positioning uh, capability GPS global positioning system to uh, see that okay the the lines here uh, show the fault surfaces and so that last point is what right about here in this map view but then the little triangles show benchmarks and the arrows that come off them are uh, like this case two meter long would be an arrow this long and the little ellipse at the head shows the uncertainty and these are from measurements before the earthquake and then done again of the same benchmark after. So the arrow would connect the kind of beginning and ending position. And so what we see is that the earthquake kind of pulled these materials in here and then offset along the fault zone and then pushed them away there in the opposite uh, sense of motion, sort of pull in and push like this. But if you look at the arrow lengths here, you see that this arrow uh, here is about two meters long. Uh, this one's even longer. It's about three meters. And then on this side, the arrows are one to two meters long. So the discontinuity, the total dis offset within this um, zone is about five meters, what I showed in the last picture. So those are the uh, kinematic analysis. That's the motions that occurred during the earthquake. But then we can use a, an engineering type tool, a mechanical or mathematical model where we can idealize the fault as this set of little rectangles and we can put a certain amount of slip on each one of those rectangles and the darker it is the more slip there was and then calculate what the expected motion would be at each one of these places so if you look closely sometimes there's two arrows so one's the observation and the other's the calculation and sometimes you can't see them that means the observation and calculation were so good they're uh, hard to tell apart uh, and so what this does is it gives us a, a access to kind of modern um, engineering tools that we use in geology to uh, explore the behavior of the earth. So this is another kind of dynamic analysis. So in summary then, today what I showed you was uh, some geologic structures. We talked about the Grand Canyon and then also primary and secondary structures and then went through these basic introductory concepts of deformation and then the three kinds of analyses, descriptive, kinematic, and dynamic or mechanical analysis.